Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm David Breer, the Group CEO here at 11FS. In today's episode, we're going to be asking, will PSD3 really live up to the expectations? The open banking sector is currently abuzz following the unveiling of proposals from the Payment Services Directive 3 by the European Commission. For fintechs, banks, financial services players, and even non-financial services players as well, these proposals are a huge deal, which could really shape the next decade of our industry. So to mark the unveiling, we're bringing you an episode from our archive. Back in July last year, I sat down with some serious heavyweights of the open banking sector to rate the success of PSD2 and look at what the industry is hoping for from this new legislation. It's a really passionate conversation and one well worth revisiting right now. Enjoy. Fintech Insider community, we need your help. The 11FS Awards returns on Wednesday, 15th of November, and we will be celebrating the people and businesses from across the globe who are helping to move the industry forward. This is where you come in. Do not miss your chance to influence who takes home an 11FS Awards trophy, whether they're trying to make the world a better place for their customers, changing the game for businesses, or utilizing AI to improve their customer experience. We want you to tell us who is building the best stuff. Submit your nominations right now at 11fsawards.com. That's 11fsawards.com. Okay, let's get started. As always, I'm joined by a panel of amazing guests who can shed some light on this topic. So first, I am joined by Lixa Develuca. Did I get that right? Develuca. Develuca, there we go. Lixa, can you give us a bit of a recap for Payment Solved? Uh, I know, obviously, uh, you've been on the podcast before, but for anybody who wasn't listening for that particular episode, it would be great for you to give a bit of an overview. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the, having me today. Um, Payment Solved is a consultancy that provides strategic advice on regulatory and policy issues uh, within the payments ecosystem, covering everything from central bank digital currency, cryptocurrencies, and of course, uh, PSD2, going forward, PSD3, and open banking. Very, very good. Uh, as again, uh, esteemed colleague in that sense, in terms of, uh, I'm going to be firing all the hard questions at you at that point. Then, uh, uh, next up, we have uh, making a, another appearance on the show, Dan Morgan, who is the policy lead for Europe at Plaid. Welcome back to the show, Dan. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Great. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. Busy week. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, who's been living over under a bit of a rock, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Plaid? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the policy lead. I spend my day speaking to regulators and, and governments trying to trying to interpret and shape the future for our business and the industry. So looking at stuff like this quite a lot. Um, and Plaid is an open banking payments platform that connects with over 12,000 different banks on that side of the ecosystem and powers over 6,000 different fintech applications on the other side of the ecosystem uh, in the UK, across Europe, and of course in the US. Very, very cool. Great to have you back. Uh, and making his FinTech Insider debut, we have Thibaut Debazi, who is Vice Chairman and General Manager at the Payments Association UK. Uh, sorry, EU. Um, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you, David. I'm a big fan of the show. I'm very proud to be here. Very cool. Well, it's great to have you on. Uh, for What should the audience know about you and the Payments Association? Well, the Payments Association EU is a business club of decision makers in the payment industry. So our members are companies from uh, all the different components of the payments value chain. And we are active in the 27 countries of the European Union. Uh, we organize events up to twice per month in a different uh, European capital. We manage collaborative projects, we publish research, and we also provide training, David. Very, very cool. Uh, get, well, I think we, I think the producers have smashed it with guests this this week in terms of this subject matter. It feels like uh, feels like we've got a power panel here, which is nice. So uh, um, maybe if we get off with uh, looking at the impacts of PSD two, then since twenty eighteen, I mean, on a on a scale of one to ten, I'm gonna, I can't believe we didn't make that on a one to eleven scale. Producers, like, I feel like we're gonna bring that up in performance management at some point. But how how would our panel score the rollout of PSD2? Um, Dan, maybe starting with you, how do you think uh, on a one to 10 ratio that people have actually done in this sense? 
So we had a, a little chat before. I think it's around five or six, but it really depends on where in the EU we're talking. And that's one of the main issues is harmonization, interpretation, enforcement in different member states. Is the directive or regulation? Uh, and so there are, there are common issues, but there are particular acute issues in, in other or particular markets. So it really depends, uh, depends where, but I think it's solid and, and you know, the fundamentals of, of what it's unleashed and created in the market is, is really super positive. But um, in terms of like uh, impact today, I think it's probably about six. Okay, six. You know, firm but fair potentially. But Nilixi, what do you reckon? Uh, one to ten, where are we going? So, yeah, I would put it, I would say probably slightly higher than Dan at seven. Um, and that's because I think if you look at the objectives of PSD2, which was uh, security, competition, innovation, I think that it's delivered on all those. The challenge is, as Dan has already highlighted, implementation, harmonization. And I think that obviously these are all things that can be addressed uh, as we look forward to PSD3. Very good. I mean, we always hope the sequel is going to explain it, doesn't it? You know, I, I had the same uh, hope with Jurassic Park, but it never quite works out like that, does it? But uh, so we'll have to see what's in there. But uh, Tebo, what do you reckon? Uh, one to ten, where where are you going? Seven out of ten, and this is actually based on the feedback we got from our members uh, because we have organised. Uh, 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 feedback to the consultation of the European Commission. And uh, on average, our members uh, somewhat agree that PSD2 has been effective in reaching its main objective. Okay, interesting. And I guess sticking with you on that then, I mean, what, what do you think the, the biggest successes have been so far? Because obviously, uh, I mean, there's a, there was so much sort of hype, so much potential there. There's so many sort of different people getting, you know, excited in various different slices of the industry in that sense. So, you know, what do you think the the real successes have been that have been possible because of PSD2? Well, two main points. Uh, the obvious first one is, of course, the emergence of new business models and new competition. Because when you look at the EBA database, we are talking about 200 licenses for payment initiation services and 300 licenses for account information services. So uh, think about this, David. For each single license, there is a new company evolving and developing with the sole purpose of making its own product and services superior to everything that existed before. So that in itself is a gigantic success. And the second one is, of course, on the strong customer authentication because according to several measures, it is uh, estimated that the fraud has been reduced by 20 to 30 percent since uh, 2020. However, and I guess we'll develop that later, it comes with uh, abandoned uh, uh, transactions, which comes at a cost in terms of lost revenues. Yeah. I mean, it's an, it's an interesting point that, I mean, the, the amount of organizations that have been created because of this in that sense, although, although my parents used to tell me when I was little, just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. You know, like, so there's a just, there's, there's a sense of, you know, opportunity doesn't necessarily translate through to consumer benefit in that sense in, in there. But, you know, your point around if fraud, uh, and actually that can be traceable back to PSD2 and the, the capability that's been exposed has dropped by that amount. I mean, that's huge in terms of the, the impact on the industry. But I mean, Dan, like, I mean, arguably, Plaid could do what Plaid does without having access to APIs. I mean, there are organizations that have done data aggregation, all of the, but it's made it a lot more reliable and a lot more uh, trustworthy as a process, having the uh, real good frameworks to be able to sort of push back on in these things, right? So, uh, I mean, arguably you are a success story in that sense, in terms of actually all of the things that PSD2 and beyond that has enabled, right? Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, we operate uh, our home market is is the United States, and we you know we've, we've obviously been very successful there. But one thing we really appreciate in a regulated market in Europe here is that certainty that that the business model is you know is sort of valid and, and, and agreed with by the regulators in the state, and you can build around that that we have access to this payments data, and we can build a model around that, and that's why there's been so much growth in the number of TPPs and. Um, and, and different business models and, and new models built around that. So I think that is, is, is key and that idea around portability, around you know, breaking down asymmetric markets and bringing more competition in and opening that data up in payments is an idea which has been emulated around the world and, and, uh, and copied and, and developed on and built on open finance. And so 
that development is is absolutely critical uh, and not to be dismissed. And when I say six, our class six is a good score. That was a two one in uh, in university. So, but there's there's room for for improvement. So, no, I, I think it's absolutely key that that the, it came into place. It just in terms of the level one, the directive, the, the level one stuff is is, is great. You know, it, it really opened up. I think some of the big issues are how the level one was implemented uh, and some of the level two text has, has sort of put some um, grit in the wheels, if you will. So SCA, of course, it's reduced fraud, but it's also been a bit of an issue uh, for TPPs in, in terms of having to re-authenticate every 90 days. Um, including um, uh, AML requirements for like AIS, simple functions, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's been a success, but I think it could be better. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, uh, firstly, Dan, if you think a six is a good, like, uh, you must be, it must be really tough manager. Like, uh, <laughs> like there's been some real difficult performance management conversations this quarter, haven't there? But, uh, but um, I mean, it's interesting because we're, we're all quite pro and actually quite positive here, you know, six as a side type thing then. Um, but actually, if you look into the market, I mean, somebody like um, Amboden, you know, Amboden, you know, Starling CEO doesn't sort of mince her words in any way, shape or form, but she's described open banking. Obviously, that's the, you know, the UK implementation of everything that's happened there as a flop. Uh, so, you know, that's that's quite a significant sort of statement in that sense. So, Anne sort of went on to say, look, the the it was too costly, it was too clunky, and said that businesses struggled to actually make money from it in that sense. So she sort of cited the fact that the in the UK, nine of the CMA nine banks missed the initial rollout of deadline, which, you know, isn't, isn't actually that too much of a surprise. You know, regulation is very costly, very, you know, difficult, very lengthy for big organizations to implement. So that's not that much of a surprise. But uh, I mean, Alexia, what do you think? Is Anne, is Anne being a bit main here? Or is it, do you think there's um, some sort of groundings in uh, in what she said? Well, I think, um, you know, it was a headline grabbing statement, wasn't it? She's I great think, at those, isn't she? She really is. I think is, yeah. that there is, there is a lot of um, value in the comments Anne made because it was expensive. But I think there's a lot of, you know, devil in the detail of that conversation as well, because I would say that a lot of costs that we had in the UK, and we're being UK specific now, um, was down to, you know, banks' own systems. For, for an organisation like Starlin, that is a, a platform provider, an API-first organisation, rolling out to PSD2 was really not big ticket stuff, was it? But yeah. when you look at the incumbents that had to do it, then it wasn't the API that was the problem. It was the connectivity to their own backend systems that I think, you know, still continues to provide challenges. And, you know, that's one of the conversations about how do we do um, access to data going forward. I think that there was in some quarters this expectation of a big bang. Everybody's going to sign up and use open banking. Well, you know, I, I don't think that was ever going to happen. It's going to be a slow burn. It continues to be a slow burn. It's not going to have, in my view, any sort of hockey stick moment until we have some of these challenges that we know today solved for. So 90-day refunds, um, wider data sets. It, it's very limited, isn't it? I can share my payment account data. Well, you know, I mean, Dan and other providers will know that there's there's limit to what you can do if you don't have the other financial services data, like what savings have I got? What insurance have I got? Do I have a pension? Do I have investments? Do I have a mortgage? Uh, and that's where I think the real value is going to come from as we move from this conversation about open banking to open finance. And I think at the moment, even if you look at the UK example, we're struggling. I mean, I, I would say that as far as I can see, open banking in the UK, to all intents and purposes, has stalled. You know, this move to open finance is not going at pace. And yes, it's great we have more functionality, variable recurring payments. But where is that big ticket conversation about how do we get these other products and data sets into the ecosystem? Well, there was a bill um, put before Parliament. Did you see that next to the, uh, the, the, the data protection and um, I forgot the name of the bill actually apologies uh, but it includes the smart data provision within it I, I, we were encouraged to see that it came as a surprise given the political turmoil that's going on that was still waiting in the wings obviously a lot of work after that but I have to say we, we, we're pretty bullish that it could be closer than we think on the movement towards open finance 
In the UK, maybe, but this is one of the challenges. Is this, so we're relying upon a regulatory framework to move this forward. Even in the UK, that's going to be a few years away. In the EU, we're talking several years down the track before we have a regulatory framework for open finance. And actually, you know, I think that that's maybe driving not the best outcomes because if we look at all of the benefits that open data has bought, we really need open finance and, and better access and, and more data sets now to build out those products, not in seven or eight years' time when PSD3 or an open finance regulation or whatever it's going to be uh, actually takes effect. It, it's, in, it's interesting, isn't it? It's one of those um, the people in the industry. Uh, and actually, if we all got together and we talked about, well, what's our future hope for where the industry gets us to, you know, data is such a fundamental power of all of those things. So, so in, in part, uh, we're always going to be slightly underwhelmed, aren't we, because of where our aspirations are and where we really think the opportunity could be. But I mean, I, I've often said, I think for the big banks, the challenge is this is all stick. You know, this is all stick. There's, there's very little carrot, right, in the, in that sense. So, um, but I, and Elixir, I, I want to sort of touch on something you said there, because I think it's a, a, um, a really important distinction. And I know you, you wrote about this actually on a, a blog that you put out, you know, the difference a name makes in this sense, you know, payment services directive. So do you want to just talk about that a little bit in terms of the difference between uh, a directive and what that means from a, from the entities from an implementation perspective and actually from a, this is regulation and thou shalt do this? It's Because it's big, big difference, isn't it? Yeah, uh, there is. Uh, when we talk about a regulation in this context, we're talking about a regulation with a capital R. Um, so a directive uh, is, is, a, is a legislative tool um, that applies across Europe but allows member states some flexibility in how they transpose into their jurisdiction. So it actually has to be transposed into local law. And in the UK, we did that with the payment services regulations. And as I say, it allows member states within limited circumstances, you know, they don't have flexibility on every part of the directive, but within limited circumstances where those have been agreed, member states, because of their local ecosystems, their local markets, can take a slightly different approach. Whereas a regulation, um, there is no such flexibility. Member states have to do exactly the same across the board. Now, of course, that is, that is the paperwork exercise because I think the reality, and I can see Thibaut nodding there, is that even with a regulation, um, the approaches of member states can vary um, and that in itself causes problems. And... Uh, as I highlighted it in the article that I, I, I uh, wrote, a lot of, in my view, what are the challenges in PSD2 are not about whether it's a regulation or a directive. It's about having that common understanding and agreement of what we want to cover, what is the scope, how are we going to implement, and how are we going to harmonise. Um, and at this point in time, I'm not sure that a regulation is the right direction of travel. Yeah, but um, one thing you talked about all stick and, and what about harmonization and, and agree principles is I, I do think banks need more skin in the game longer term to, uh, to make this self-sustainable. I mean, we're involved in something called the SPA MSG, the Separate Payment Account Access Scheme, uh, and it's about a, a, a potential framework or scheme above PSD2, above a baseline, which is about premium services for a, a default remuneration fee, which is still to be decided and negotiated between banks and TPPs. It's a long way to go. It's a European-led initiative, uh, EPC-led initiative. Um, but I think things like that, longer term, are where we'll see value. And this might come around a lot quicker uh, than potential a directive, which through trilogue and everything could be a hell of a long time away. Um, so I think ideas about ways that we can bring banks to the table for them to, to build beyond a compliance exercise is, is going to be key. And I know we had similar discussions in the UK with premium APIs and now with commercial uh, VIPs in terms of like, well, how do we bring them to the table? So I, I think these reforms around regulation, harmonization at, at, at that level are important, but I do think industry-led initiatives as well above it could play a key role. Can I just be a little bit controversial there? Because you, you use the term skin in the game. And I think that if I play devil's advocate, 
there is is there is this conversation about well you know what are the fintechs beyond the technology going to stump up i in terms of financing this ecosystem because obviously rightly or wrongly data under psd2 is provided at no cost to the fintech and one of the biggest challenges and why this ended up i think being a, a compliance exercise is because one side of this equation felt that they were paying for everything. And I think that is actually the biggest stumbling block to moving on with this conversation about open finance is that commercial ecosystem as to who contributes what. How is it equitable? How do we move it forward? And how do we make it sustainable? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, back to my point earlier on around like that's a big stick. Do you know what I mean? Like, and a big stick that you're being forced to do in that sense. It, I, I oft, often sort of said the, you know, the big banks had all of the the sort of determination to do this as a a teenager being told to clean their room. You know, it was uh, it was begrudgingly at best in that sense because of exactly the points that you were kind of making. But so so I, I, look, we agree. Like this is a this is a good idea, right? We're not going to just scrap it. We're not going to like go. No, we'll just. Call it a day on this podcast and we're PSD3. It's not going to catch on. Like, no, I, like, I think to your point, though, Nelixia, I think it's like, so why are we doing this? I think PSD2 and actually open banking and the seven, uh, you know, we're talking really specifically here in the UK, seven day switching and then the ease of competition with uh, gaining access to new banking. It was a, a tapestry of changing the competitive landscape within the, the UK system. And that then blew into, you know, global change, didn't it, with other regulators and everything that really happened in that space. I don't think it's just this, but I think just this is, is a great uh, momentum platform in terms of actually everything that could happen. So speaking of that momentum, let's look forward then. Like we've uh, we've got it off our chest. You know, PSD2 didn't quite get to where we wanted it to. People didn't quite adopt it. There wasn't enough carrot, like all of these uh, metaphors that I keep bringing up. Um, but what do we want to see going forward then? Um, I mean, T-Road, T- starting start with you, what's the, what do you expect from PSD3? Do you think it's going to be the... Uh, the best movie in the trilogy or is this going to be something that actually just kind of is an evolutionary step in terms of where we're going no no the the future is bright uh, especially in the eu because you know we have this fantastic thing in the eu which is passporting right which means you have a license in one country you can export it to the other and that means if you are a local champion in one country potentially you can be a continental champion the day after but so far it doesn't work very well why because you have as we said local authorities who still have some uh, uh, freedom to impose extra hurdles in developing the business across the eu so in psg3 we have to solve that one way or the other is it through directive or regulation actually it's a very juridical debate Uh, What our members have told us is that what they want is a regulation that is very much outcome-based, that instead of prescribing things such as the three components of SCA or uh, prescribing the way that the banks should give access to the fintechs, actually the objectives should be defined and then all the industry players should be measured up against meeting those objectives. So this is what is expected in general from PSD3. And on SCA in particular, uh, many of our members have expressed the frustration again that uh, in the current uh, setup, you cannot use uh, new techniques, new technologies such as behavioral um, uh, and uh, behavioral elements, etc. So that is a whole technical debate. So again, um, yes, uh, we, we potentially Europe, EU especially, can be um, the the, the craddock of the future global players if it allows itself the right balance between regulation and the industry uh, bringing its own solution. Yeah. I mean, on that that point, and a lot of what you were talking about there, uh, I mean... uh, again, we, we've decided we're going to drop the D from PSD, but do we need to drop the P there as well? You know, like a lot of what you're referring to there is broader than just payments, isn't it, in every sense? So, you know, is that the hope in this this next chapter of it, that actually, you know, the success, the momentum that we have seen within the purely in the payment space gets opened up further and further? Um, actually, you know, obviously we, we specialize into payments, so that, that is our uh, uh, playground. But as mentioned before, the, the main fear 
is the conflict between different EU regulation. Uh, this is what Nilixa described in her latest brilliant uh, blog, is that a blog post, is that the problem day to day of the industry is to say, okay, we want to be compliant with PSD2, 3 whatsoever. And then suddenly you have GDPR, which is dropped on you and which is not fully coherent. And then people ask many questions to their local regulators, to their, uh, even to the European regulators. And then uh, on top of that, you get up Mika, you get up uh, the open finance stream in general. So those are all good. Those are all great. And the Commission and the EV are doing a fantastic job. But let's just be coherent. And probably the best way to be coherent is to do it one step at a time. Sounds good. I can't tell you how much I'm still pained by the, the your your distinction between Europe as a, a as a continent and Europe as a union. It's uh, we miss passporting. We'd like it back if that would be possible, but uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, Dan, what, what do you what do you think? What uh, what do you hope to see within PSD three? Which rhymes, and I'm quite impressed by that. Yeah, I agree with a lot of the comments uh, that, that have already been made. Uh, it's a tricky one with the expanding AIS to other data because that's in the open finance consultation. But I think whether it falls in there or it falls under the payment side, we want to expand beyond just payment accounts. I think that should be a, a bedrock of what we're aiming to work towards. Uh, and whether that comes through this piece or not uh, will, will, will to, to be seen. Um, I agree in the moves around uh, uh, directive to regulation. A lot needs to be harmonized, especially if you're, you're key on, on uh, expanding across Europe. Passporting is very patchy at the moment. Definition of payment accounts is not the same in different markets. The treatment of things called agents um, and, and triangular passporting, if we provide the data services, they can't necessarily always cross borders um, and, and enforcement is mixed. So if there's an issue like connecting to a bank in a certain country and you go to the NCA, the local regulator, if you're not domestically regulated there, they don't want to speak to you. And so they won't enforce the, the action. You have to have a collective action for the local firms there. And that's often why there's national champions and, and often regulators are protecting the banks, uh, not an incoming uh, passporting TPP. So enforcement is, is pretty patchy. Uh, I think SCA, clearly, um, I think we should reconsider the 90-day the reconsent for AIS. I think it seems to be disproportionate uh, for the risk uh, involved. And I'd like to see the TPP control SCA going forward, manage that consent, whether through a dashboard or other, seems to be the place where they are managing that relationship rather than the bank managing the reconsent, whatever period it is. Uh, like someone marking their own homework for competition, they have no incentive to to make that experience uh, a, a good one. Uh, there's other little things within there that can be tidied up, like TPPs have a limit on daily API calls. I think is you know there's there's an, lots and lots of things we could we could pick out. Um, and again, I think the fact that this may be not a part of the, the regulation or the EBA, but AIS being included for anti money laundering requirements seems to be. Uh, a bit of an, an overstretch. There's plenty of things, but I think they'd be the, probably on our list to, to have a look at. Yeah, I mean, some of those are, um, you know, operational as in it makes it easy to operate. Some of them are just like the uh, refresh in terms of giving access from a customer's perspective. It's just really bad experiences right now, aren't they? And I think that's where I'd hope, um, you know, there would be a, a bit more of a view of now that these things are implemented, sort of knocking off some of the edges in that sense. But uh, I mean, Nilixia, what do you what do you hope to see within PSD3? Uh, a holistic, forward-looking piece of legislation, in a nutshell. Um, and to put some uh, sort of context around that, there is a lot happening with the EU market. We've got PSD3, we've got data strategies, we've got Mika, we've got a digital euro, we've got the expansion of Target 2, just to name a few. We've got the Digital Services Act, we've got the regulation of platform providers, we've got a big ticket conversation on reciprocity. And this is just one piece of that jigsaw. And at the end of this, it needs to work holistically. Thibaut mentioned it, you know, we already have those challenges between how does PSD and GDPR fit together? You know, how are all of these initiatives and PSD3, uh, including the sort of bringing together of PSD2 and EMD2, actually going to fit together? How is it going to work well for the market? How is it going to work well for consumers? PSD2 was, you know, a piece of legislation that has been replicated across the globe, whether it's the services part, whether it's the open banking part. You know, other jurisdictions have now moved on. They've taken lessons learned. They've gone to, you know, a different way of operating. So 
it's appropriate to look across the globe, bring those best practices into the EU ecosystem and to ensure that there is that flexibility because this legislation is going to be implemented in several years' time. And we know, we know from the experience of SCA that the point in time the decision was made that this is how we're going to do SCA, it was out of date by the time we got to implementing how are we going to do SCA. So it's got to have that flexibility, that sort of forward-looking agenda. And, uh, you know, let's be honest, this is, that's a big ask. It's not an easy thing for regulators to have to put in place a piece of legislation that will accommodate that. Um, but I do think that if the EU wants to continue to be world leading in this area of financial services and how it frames its uh, legislative framework, you know, Mika's another example, then these are the really big ticket issues that are going to have to be addressed. I also think there needs to be a really clear indication of whether, you know, the Commission is just looking at open finance or whether this is going to lay the framework for open data. Because if, if that is the direction of travel, then that should be part of the discussion, the planning now, and not in seven years' time when we have PSD2, when we're already talking about PSD4. Yeah. I mean, that that's the, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I, I think actually this, the future of the industry is all of these interconnected things moving forwards in that sense. But the industry is moving quicker than the regulation. So are are we in, and I had this, uh, had this conversation with Charlotte Croswell, um, who's leading OBIE uh, in the UK recently, actually, which is like, her job isn't really about a legislation and putting in place something in like five years' time. It's like she's the product manager for open banking. You know, this isn't a – gone are the days where it's some regulation and then there's some, you know, a bunch of consultancies consult with a bunch of companies and tell them the four things that they have to do. And then four years later, that's done. This is like backlog territory here. So, you know, how do we – whether it's variable payments, whether it's, you know, anything in this mix, like almost the – the, the the fabric of the industry that will be built upon it over the next, you know, decade really is about continually evolving and continually building those things. But to your point, that like that's a really different job for the regulator, isn't it? And actually, you know, the regulator is not used to being the, you know, the digital ecosystem center point player for, you know, that that backlog. So that's um how how do we uh, particularly a, a, a European regulator in that sense, in terms of all of those multi-jurisdiction controls, as as you've all sort of said. So, so how do we get to that? Because that sounds like that sounds like major cultural transformation of actually what the the European regulators and global regulators are really there to to create. Uh, and I think a, a few. I mean, this, this is getting big now in terms of like we're, suddenly we're reforming regulators across the entirety of the world in that sense but but like this is what's needed if if the 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 potential to really unlock everything that we can do in financial services this is the scale of change so dan good luck answering that one my friend i think that that's the politics isn't it um you know a lot of uh, local ncas they may not have a competition mandate like in the fca which has obviously been granted politically or or, or innovation within their within their mandate. So it isn't necessarily going to come from a member state level at all points. It's been driven politically about the commission and others and what they want to do. But I, I'm pretty confident that they think they're saying the right things at the moment. I think in the data side, they've moved beyond that. Uh, the EU was the first out of the track thinking about privacy and the risks associated with one's personal data. And now they're really focused on what comes next in terms of portability and opening up their markets to create the same things we have in PSD in other markets through the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, in how we can you know, empower consumers as well as aware of their risks, the upside to having that power of their data as well. And payments is a small part of it at the moment, but they're looking beyond that. Um, and that's really in- exciting and encouraging. And I think we'll see a, a real growth in the data economy more broadly in the EU. And they're looking at the right things. Things are always tricky with a multi-state block of course and could be a long time but they're, they're thinking about things in the right way and I think they're, they're doing that first um, more broadly on digital as well uh, they are thinking about how post pandemic digital services and financial services are can be thought about in a holistic fashion so digital ID and the wallet um, really good idea cross border there's lots of good examples across the EU of like digital ID and they're trying to bring these things together to 
bring some harmonization, which could support financial services and other parts of the economy. So really excited about that. That could be really beneficial to open banking and essential for open finance. And then another infrastructural play that they're, they're pushing that we're really excited about is the mandating instant payments. We take instant payments for granted in the UK and some individual member states, but as the EU as a whole, access to separate inst is patchy. I think uh, there's like 4,000 banks not signed up to it yet. Sending and receiving doesn't quite match, um, and sometimes it can be expensive. So getting that free and, and ubiquitous across the EU as well will drive the other services and create a much more harmonized digital framework. And they're all thinking about this together. So I, I, I think implementation is going to be the next big tricky one, and things take a long time in the EU, but they're thinking about this together and how that works. So I'm, we're pretty bullish. Yeah. Well, and as you say, it's this isn't just something within a, you know, tiny little island in the UK or or Europe. It's a it's a global problem in that sense in terms of actually tying these things together. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in the next part of the show. So, uh, we're just going to take a little bit of a quick break. We'll be back with you very shortly. We all know SMEs are the backbone of any economy. So, why are they still so underserved? 67% of them globally say fighting for survival is their top challenge. It's time for financial services to put its cape on. At 11 Affairs Ventures, we're building, researching, strategizing, designing, and engineering game-changing propositions with banks and fintechs to better serve the SME market. We've already helped RBS better serve small business owners and sole traders by bringing metal to life. So the question is, what do you want us to help make a reality for you? Let us know at 11 slash ventures. That's 11 slash ventures. Okay, so if we take a look at that sort of open banking global view in that sense, and, and Dan, you touched on this a little bit in terms of the, the the scale and actually operating as a business globally with all of these different you know regulations. I mean that that is a that is a challenge, isn't it? But do you think the? I mean, we've seen at Eleven FS, we've seen people implementing uh, open banking standards in geos that have no requirement to do it because it's just the, the 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 momentum from an industry perspective in that sense, particularly where you're looking at organizations that operate in jurisdictions where it is required. They're taking that approach to other areas as well. So do you think actually the momentum globally that sort of kicked off on this is, is generally positive in that sense? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I don't know how many different initiatives there are on open banking and open finance around the world. I probably should have got that, but there are quite a few. Um, and um, they're all uh, you know, developing slightly differently with some reasonable amount of uh, you know, uh, consensus around certain areas. And to some extent, I think started to, to harmonize. So in the US was a an unregulated approach to open banking, open finance actually grew a much bigger market in a totally different way. But some of the things you can do in the services, much more like an open finance type environment uh, already. But the ideas around privacy and around a regulatory framework have started to grow. So 1033 and rulemaking is starting to come in. And we take calls all the time with uh, US regulators asking about the approach in the UK because we're a US uh, open banking player based in the UK and the EU. So they listen to you know, our point of view on these things uh, all the time. So I don't think there's a, a single uh, approach in terms of how we're doing that. But I do think having a certain um, framework around it, which um, fundamentally enshrines the right of the individual to access and share their data to get a better deal is something that we're seeing a harmonization around. How we get there and the sort of path dependency that leads us to that way. Of course, Europe will go regulation first and the US the other way around will vary. But I think there's a harmonization that that right needs to be enshrined. Um, and, and that's that's pretty positive. Uh, uh, Nilix, I mean, Dan touched on this a little bit earlier on around, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the UK's competition mandate sort of is a lens in which a lot of these things is looked at with regards to why this change is sort of happening. But, you know, as, as Dan sort of touched on, the US has a very different approach in that sense. And, you know, Canada has a very different approach in it. But we're all sort of getting to a similar place. Do you think, you touched on this at the very beginning, it's like, why are we doing this in the first place? Do you think there's enough tie back to, well, why are we doing this in the first place? And consistency at that level would be probably needed to ensure we have something that's, you know, interoperable from a global level. Ooh, interoperable from a global level is a slightly different conversation, I think, David. But um, I think why 
Why Set yourselves in here, guys. It's going to be a four-hour podcast, yeah. just so you know this one. <laughs> Why are jurisdictions doing this? And I think at the core of that is a fundamental belief that this provides uh, an infrastructure, an ecosystem, where people can access better financial services. To date, you know, certain types of financial services have only been available to those who are, who are better off, wealthy, whatever category you want to put them in. Open banking and the technology that drives open banking and the access to data and how that is sort of mashed together, I don't know what the technical term is, um, gives individuals information that they didn't previously have in a way that they couldn't previously access. And therefore, I think that all jurisdictions that are looking at this ecosystem are thinking, we think that, you know, our our people can have better financial services, make better decisions if they can make use of service providers that take this data uh, and pull it together for them. Obviously, you know, that's the vision. There are challenges and barriers, fundamental ones that have to be overcome. And one of those is actually inclusion. You know, the fundamental of this ecosystem is that you have digital access. You have online access. And of course, there are, there are parts of the world where, although you can do that, it, it's reliant upon, obviously, telecoms, uh, infrastructure, um, electricity even, that makes it difficult for this to be a fully inclusive ecosystem until those issues are addressed. I think there's also, you know, so that's that's the sort of politics of it. I think for those people who are open banking users and that number is growing, there is sort of the remit of, well, we did it because it would be a good idea and we've never accessed it. Um, to those who are actually, fundamentally, this is helping me with day-to-day -day decisions. This is helping me to better manage my money. And something like variable recurring payments and sweeping which, you know, helps people save, you know, incrementally, maybe small amounts, but it all makes a difference in the long run, which helps people think about how do I provide for my pension? How do I provide for my future? You know, I truly believe that that has got to be a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it goes back to that point I was making earlier on a little bit about what do we believe the future of the industry is? Because actually, I completely buy into what you're saying in terms of the, you know, getting access and get, you know, di digital access, mobile access, da, 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 da. but it's like, actually, like, I'm not sure I need another pie chart in my life, you know what I mean? Like, so actually being in a situation where um, gaining access is one thing, but education of financial services is so low anyway that I'm not sure, I'm not sure just giving people the the instruments is, like, my, my view of the future of financial services is like, just do it for me. Like, you know, your regulated entities who are educated on financial services, tell me what the thing is to do. Better end, just do it, you know, do it without telling me. And that sort of automated financial services that gets people to be better off because you're with that organization, the fundamental to that is great data. And then beyond that is the ability to enact some sort of action, whether it's a transfer or a payment, as you say, in sweeps or whatever, you know, and that's that's the future that I think we all want to get to, isn't it? Which is, we stop talking about APIs and open banking and, you know, PSD 47 or whatever it is. And then we move to a world where customers are fundamentally better off by being with organizations. Tibor, you were aching to jump in at that point. No, David, because this is where I think in the EU, there is a very career vision. Because when you look at the objectives, actually, those are the same for the regulator and for the players. Because what do we want? A true level playing field. And that is our big difference with the EU. West, right? It's that the level playing field is guaranteed by regulation, which is not the case in the US, where it is left to market forces. And this comes with the complexity on the regulation side that you might have to ask 50 licenses for 50 states, like uh, you uh, uh, described very well in other shows when, when uh, European players try to enter the US market, right? So that's one. The second one is that everyone wants reduced complexity from the player's point of view, from the consumer point of view. And the key aspect for the consumer is their protection, right? And by the way, you know, in some countries, some European countries, the problem of inclusion is, has been solved just by saying that 
any bank should provide a basic financial package to any citizen, whatever their state. And by the way, this is why people say, for example, why didn't payment initiation services via open banking, why didn't it work in the EU? Because guess what? It's even worse than in the UK. Um, payment initiation services represent less than 1% of e-commerce payments in Europe. Well, the optimist point of view is to say, well, because they were already well served, you know, in the EU, the obvious champion for payments is the debit card, even for online transactions. And then on top of that, you get the alternative uh, payment schemes that uh, you might know, of course, so forth in Germany, ideal in the Netherlands, etc. And on top of that, lately, you get BNPL. So that's the optimistic view to, to look at it. The um, pessimistic view is to say, okay, open banking is not raising because of the fragmentation, the problems, the hurdles, etc. And um, just to conclude, one of, of course, the big issue is to say, once you set the level playing field, how much does it cost to the players to implement it? Because that was one of the big issues with PSD2. It cost a lot of money for the players to implement it. And to the credit of the banks, they have invested a lot in getting the access being uh, deployed. And then they were useless because the regulation in the meantime had changed. The regulation came back with uh, other opinions and Q&As. And this is what's not working. And this is what we need to improve. Yeah, it's strange uh, in that in that point, as you said, and and uh, I think all of, all of you have sort of referenced that. I mean, this cost the banks a lot of money to to put all of these things in place. Like perversely, it, it probably has saved their lives in many instances. Similar similar to what we saw with mobile banking, like the the need to adopt. Uh, APIs and uh, and more agile working methods because it was fundamentally different meant that the banks actually had the ability to do other things with that. Like, I, I wonder how much, you know, it's like your doctor forcing you to have a healthy diet. It's like, you know, there's a there's auxiliary benefits of doing that in that sense that they probably uh, found in that, in that way. But all right, well, as we said, this could literally be a four-hour podcast at this point in terms of going off into one of these rabbit holes in it. But, you know, let's get really specific in terms of like, what would be the the one directive that you got, you know, obviously there's a, a huge amount of people who are submitting papers in terms of the consultation for PSD3, various different, you know, people with various different, uh, you know, benefits that they'll drive from, you know, moving this in one way or another. Um, what would be your one directive to the regulators who'd be assessing these consultations for PSD3? Dan, let's go with you. To the assessor, one, one uh, let me let me wind that. But in terms of what they should do or how they should assess it, um, I mean, I think we we picked on the. I, I think the big move towards an open data society and open finance is what we should be doing. So, like, how we get there, how that ties in with the payments ecosystem, and having as an elixir said, a clear strategy going forward with all the other things that that are on the docket at the moment would be my number one thing to find that clarity that when we came out of this to say, this is our plan on PSD and open finance, this is how they work together, and this is our roadmap to implementing it over the next, you know, dream moonshot three years, <laughs> then this is a program as companies operating in the EU market, you can put in place uh, investments and think about how you respond to that and unlock portability uh, and a whole new range of services for EU citizens. Sounds good. Let's triple down. Keep going. I like I like that mentality. And Alexia, what do you, what do you think? What uh, what do you want them to hear from this process? Be mindful of how a digital euro ecosystem fits into the provision of payment services, um, because that is on a different track. It's run by the ECB, um, but. If you believe that the European Union is going to issue a digital euro, and if you look at the speeches that come out of the ECB, you know, senior members, that's not going to be, that's going to happen before PSD2 is implemented. Then there must be a link between how that payments by digital euros fits and works within a PSD3 open finance ecosystem. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Actually, everything we're talking about is decentralized implications of regulation on decentralized systems. But actually, at the point where you've got a, a centralized digital currency, uh, you know, euro or whatever it ends up being, then that would be a, a really interesting one, wouldn't it? And that's a that's a world beyond this, isn't it? In terms of the the impact to the oversight a, a regulator can really have on a, a, a truly digital, truly centralized system. In that sense, Tibo, what what do you think? What what do you want them to uh, to hear from this? Uh, encouragement, or you know, uh, where where are we going? 
Now, what, what we want is a true level playing field within the EU, especially for the, the players that seek to expand uh, beyond their national market. That's, that's the key thing. Um, so in, in one sentence, this is what we, we are aiming at. Very, very good. I think for, for me, I'd, I'd say, I mean, I agree going back to your points earlier on. I think we're about a six, maybe a seven if we really pushed it. Like, actually, we've done good. We've set people's expectations. People are using it for really different reasons. But there's so much more potential to to cover in this space, which is really, really exciting. And actually, I mean, that's the thing that always we get our bed for, right? The, this is the best time to be doing these things, the, the things we can do today that we couldn't do tomorrow. And I'm hoping what PSD three really brings is is even more things that we can do in terms of ways to serve customers and, and make their experiences better. So uh, let's see what happens. I can't imagine it'll be the last time we'll be talking about it. But that does wrap up today's show, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, where can people learn a little bit more about you and your company? Alexia, I'll start with you. Um, by contacting me directly via LinkedIn would be the easiest way. Very, very good. Dan? Yeah, at, at DanMorgan1 on Twitter or Plaid.com uh, for more about Plaid. Very cool. Thibaut? LinkedIn and Twitter on my personal profile or the one of the association, so the Payments Association EU. Very good. As for me, you can find me lurking on LinkedIn most, most of these days. Uh, thank you very much for listening, everybody. If you like what you heard, subscribe to the podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us make it better and helps other people find the show as well. As always, if you want to find us, you can find us on pretty much every social media channel at this stage. If you want to join the conversation, then head over to podcast at 11fs.com. That's podcasts at 11fs.com. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Goodbye.